Well, thank you all for coming today. We're looking forward to giving us a general overview as we look at Jollyman's all-inclusive playground. Um, I'm going to be sharing my screen and walking us through a little presentation here to give us an overview and make sure that we are on the same page. Um, and I, since I cannot actually see your faces, I'm going to assume that things are good. And Melissa, if you uh, just let me know if something goes astray, we'll kind of go from there. So with that, welcome to our inclusive play primer or primer. Um, this is set to give us an overview. So we all have the same um, shared baseline as we move forward with this project and just have a basic understanding with that. I'm going to give you a very brief overview of our firm, um, just so that you kind of have that as a setting. This is something that we've been working on since our inception. Um, our core team working specifically on the inclusive primer um, are myself, Melissa Erickson, Melissa Butler, um, who is a key part of our team, Jen Eastland, who is the project manager, and then Amy Mitchell, who is also a certified play safety inspector, um, but provides another lens through our play studio, which we will talk about momentarily. So MIG, who are we? Um, we are the folks that you hired to be looking at Jollyman and looking at the all-inclusive playground um, design there. We are a multidisciplinary firm, a variety of different professionals, um, really looking at trying to tell stories, but basing it on, on research and knowledge, but creative problem solving is a key part of that. We believe very strongly that the environment is a key part of the process and COVID has certainly made that all the more pertinent as far as the need for quality outdoor spaces throughout our lives. Um, and really looking at how that can better support life in general, um, our own positive social context and coordination, um, but just how we function from one another. We are about 250 people. We work out of 13 offices. We have 37 areas of expertise. We are entering our 40th year. And from the very beginning, play has been part of what we've been looking at and inclusive play specifically. Um, we were founded by um, Robin Moore, um, who is now with North Carolina State, although retiring. I'm behind the National Learning Institute. He's been doing research for 50 years, looking at inclusive play in natural environments and natural play. Um, he, Susan Goldsman, who's the G, um, who unfortunately passed a few years ago, and with Daniel Asifano, the I, all formed MIG um, 40 years ago based on an environmental psychology process and really looking at the power of the environment to shape us as humans as a key part of really kind of pushing that boundary and their interest specifically in children's environments really led to the formation of our firm. From the very beginning, we also have our research and publishing arm, um, Mid Communications, where we have actually been working specifically on a variety of accessibility components from accessibility checklists to play for all guidelines, which is still the book, even though it's 35 years old now, um, really trying to take a look at how we look more inclusively at play and looking across abilities, um, but still kind of pushing the envelope on, on that front. Um, we do have a strong accessibility practice where we're doing self-evaluation and transition plans. We have a variety of CASP um, certified accessibility specialists, which is a California specific um, requirement. We also have Texas accessibility specialists, but really trying to push accessibility both from code through design and into construction. And that's been something that we've worked on from the very inception. And there are very few firms that actually kind of offer that range, which is partly what is one of our differentiators. Within MIG, we have several specific studios that relate to this project. We have a play studio, um, which has worked with a variety of efforts to raise funds, um, do research, and really kind of push play specifically, which obviously is pertinent to this project. We also have an equity studio, which also tries to take a look at this across ages and abilities component. But we also have a variety of other kind of focus areas that gives us some additional expertise um, in addressing kind of the changing needs and dynamics as we, we move forward. Design um, is a key part of this process. Obviously, we respond to aesthetics, we respond to the context, but really making sure that we're taking a look at how can we address this for all abilities and all ages and connecting people to one another and to nature um, is really a key part of this overall aspect that we really kind of charge all of our projects with. Um, again, from our very beginning, our first project was really looking at bringing in natural systems and inclusive play and really kind of changing that construct and bringing that as a forefront. So with that as a context for why we were talking about inclusive play, 
the, today we're really kind of are focusing on six key topics just to make sure that we're on the same page when we talk about what is inclusive play and what, what why are we kind of looking at this. So we're going to do a little skim of a deep dive into the science of play. We're going to talk about disability and ability awareness, kind of accessibility in the ADA, universal design, inclusive design, and then we're specifically looking at play spaces and how we address those components. So science of play. This is one of um, our favorite quotes from Peter Gray's Free to Learn book, which I think kind of sets this overall foundation for how we really try and take a look at it, because what is it? Play is, first and foremost, an expression of freedom. We do it because we want to, not because we have to. The joy of play is the ecstatic feeling of liberty. Play is not always accompanied by smiles and laughter, nor are smiles and laughter always signs of play, but play is always accompanied by a feeling of Yes, this is what I want to do right now. And I think that's kind of one of the key things we kind of use as a, as a, a metric or a standing point for how we were trying to take a look at it because we all respond to different components. But knowing that that's what you wanna do right now is a key piece to that. There are a variety of different pieces of what play is. This happens to be a, a list of 10. We could probably spend all day talking about different um, additional components that we could add to that. But this is um, from um, an Irish um, curriculum framework that kind of uses it, which hits kind of some of the main items within there. The fact that it's voluntary, you choose to do it, that it involves a variety of different purposes, whether you're interacting with other folks or you're interacting with nature or components, that it's enjoyable. It gives you some sense of joy that is communicative, whether you're actually vocalizing or expressing it through body movements or body responses. It's sociable and interactive. And sometimes that means that you're doing that by yourself while you're watching others. And other times you're more directly interacting with folks. That it's active, it's not passive, that there is risk. And risk is a key piece because there needs to be challenge in the overall um, opportunities of what's being provided. Looking at trying to provide something that is symbolic and therapeutic. Um, there are numerous studies really trying to take a look at the power of nature and how that responds, how that increases our ability to, to heal faster, about needing less medication, uh, how it impacts our on depression. But the power of nature really is an important piece as it sets in also within play and how we interact within those areas. Now, why is it important? It shows up everywhere. TED Talks, advertisements, here's a sampling of different pieces, but play is something that really resonates. Um, and it really kind of is one of those components that we're really trying to take a look at. It's something that everyone has shared and it doesn't matter how structured it is or how informal it is, that's a key piece of what happens. It's one of those pieces that's infused through society and it is a key way of how we connect with one another and relate to it. It's also fundamental to human development. It's how we learn some of the basic social skills, behaviors, body awareness, those pieces. It's something that really resonates across the board. So there are at least four kind of uh, spectrums within healthy development that it, it really kind of hits um, as far as uh, healthy, healthy, pardon me, human development. Um, you know, it's a child's work. Play is how children actually work. It's how they are learning these critical skills that basically shape them and help setting them up for being a successful adult and advancing. Um, it's critical for overall development through kind of adulthood. And so cognitive is a range of open-ended and free play. Things are not necessarily prescriptive, but open and responsive. Emotional, the idea of learning how you share, how you collaborate, how you cooperate, that happens on a playground. Physical, your actual pure awareness of your body and space, physical strength and social cues, um, how you kind of interact along that spectrum with the other folks around. It's the main piece that helps kind of set those foundations that allows us to function throughout their other spheres of life and the rest of our life as well. Um, great little quote about why it's important. Um, intelligence is, in large part, the product of interaction with the environment. That power is so important in really trying to address where we start from and how we adapt, but having that immersive experience of being able to be fully in that moment and experience that exploration, no matter your age, is really, really important. 
So contrary to what we were raised, there are not just five senses, there's eight or even talk of nine. Um, and it's really important to kind of look at that spectrum. Um, the first five are, are the obvious ones, you know, the re certain respond to visuals, sight, how we actually um, appreciate beauty, how we see um, and take in context, how we hear things, you know, the type of um, sound characteristics that exist, the ability to kind of separate those components. Obviously touch a key piece, hot, cold, soft, fuzzy, vibrations, textures, um, taste, um, particularly on the autism spectrum, you know, everything goes into the mouth, also with toddlers, but that whole like that being a key sense that also has um, connections to memory recall, other components, smell. Um, obviously, people respond depending on the positive associations or negative associations. It has proven connections with Alzheimer's as being a memory trigger. But I want to kind of draw attention to the three kind of across the bottom of the screen, because these are the ones that have been less talked about in kind of overall um, discussions, but in play in particular are really important. Vestibular, that sense of balance about taking how we process components, our understanding of where we are in space is really critical. Um, proprioceptive, um, this starts getting us on kind of the, um, the safe sense of that, how we are organized, where our bodies connect to one another. These have different motions that trigger that balance, but understanding how our body is telling us where other parts of our body is, um, is a key um, balance need that play in particular can help address that on developmental spectrums. And then interoception, which is probably the hardest one to try and take a look at, but it's the sense when you are overridden by a need, hunger, the need to go to the restroom, the need to focus on peace that everything else shuts down because that's the only piece that your body can really kind of focus on that you shut down. It goes to, again, to kind of that kind of primary wiring, but it does bring a kind of a, a large range of being able to sort through differing, um, uh, sensory intakes and not being able to process any of it because you have a core need that is not a, being able to be addressed. So why is play important? Um, you know, it's obviously a powerful impact on learning and development. You know, we don't learn as well. Um, as schools have looked at reducing recess, outdoor time, there's been some significant research really taking a look at, at the downfall of that and how that addresses the lack of social cues, the lack of just body awareness, the ability to concentrate and focus, you know, we eventually become really just less productive human beings. Um, and play is fun, um, but it's much more about that. Um, and the last piece in red, in fact, it's often when we're playing that we feel the most alive, um, is I think a really key piece. It's also that play does not stop when we're 12. We need it throughout our life. It's obviously that we have a different sense of what that is, but it's really important. It's what connects us to one another. It allows us to kind of heal, allows us to kind of tap in and sort through a range of pieces that we are learning within the space and context of development and keeping that creative juice flowing. So with that as kind of a context, let's talk about disability awareness and what that means. So when we talk about disability, there are some images that typically come to mind give you a second to kind of think about that. And this is often what comes in place. It's usually someone who's in a wheelchair. In fact, the universal kind of symbol for disability is that pictogram of someone in a wheelchair. But disability is a lot of other pieces um, to consider. In fact, there's a range of considerations depending on the type of disability. Um, you know, there are physical pieces where we're really trying to take a look at how you actually can are able to move in a space, sit, walk, stand, reach, things that basically um, can limit some of that or your ability to address that given strength components. Some pieces of that um, or symptoms of um, that are spina bifida, muscular dystrophy, other pieces where you basically have some impairments that make it difficult to actually move and work around. Sensory components um, are, are a big piece. You know, obvious ones are, are folks that have um, hearing limitations, vision impairments, but there's also sensory processing. And probably the biggest piece is really the autism spectrum, which is a very broad range. But it's that ability of 
of an inability or a limitation in actually processing information and picking that up from the environment and being able to make sense of that communication. Um, that can be a large different pieces, whether it's actually speech or voice language, um, especially in areas where there's a large um, population of folks that maybe do not speak English or speak, you know, uh, English as a second or a third or fourth language. Um, autism fa falls on this and almost every single category within it is also the largest growing area. Socio-emotional. Um, so addressing behavior and being able to control outbursts um, and looking at how that's better controlled. I mean, there are pieces um, where that's um, kind of shown through depression, anxiety, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, a variety of other pieces on that, but really trying to kind of control that and or how well they are able to or what the triggers are that kind of sets that kind of um, spiraling out of control as a consideration. And then cognitive, which again is a broad range and somewhat more difficult to kind of identify because it's not visible. And so it um, can be expressed in ways and how people express information or how they share their emotions, how that well they're able to control that or their impulses. And that kind of, again, crosses a range of considerations, but it's not just one size fits all. There's quite a broad array of, of considerations when you're kind of looking at abilities and or you know, change of abilities. Um, it's a pretty significant um, number when you start really taking a look at, you know, about 12% of the population as of 2018 um, in the US, uh, people have some form of ability. And in fact, we like to talk about being temporarily able-bodied because at some point in our life, we will probably all have something that will limit our ability to fully function in the way that we're thinking about it. Now, what that breaks down into is ambulatory um, disability. So having to do with motion. So needing, you know, whether you need a wheelchair or a walker, but something that helps you actually physically move through space. You know, 5% is roughly cognitive, you know, how you take in information and considerations. Uh, almost four is somewhere on the hearing spectrum as far as having limitations of what folks can hear. And then about two or so is um, vision. And so having some limitation, whether it's full blindness or other, um, site limitations falls within that category. Now, there's some other pieces within that as far as self-care, folks that, that actually can't take care of their own daily activities and need assistance with that. Um, and then others that are taking a look at, um, you know, some, needing some level of assistance so that they are able to independently live. So there's a pretty broad range and it's only increasing. Um, you know, when you take a look at kind of the demographics of groups with a disability, you know, the big piece is as we get older, more of us are going to have abilities. And there's still a need for addressing, um, you know, how we function. But these are also our caregivers. These are the grandparents, other um, folks that are actually bringing kids to the playgrounds, considering that. But as we continue to kind of increase and live longer, more of us are living with disabilities. And in fact, you know, as makes sense, you know, seniors are the fastest growing segment of the population. You know, people are living longer and living longer with disabilities, um, where in the past they might have had shorter lifespans. It is estimated by, by 2040 that the number of disabled Americans will triple. Um, and the fact that the expectations are significantly more robust now I'm taking a look at. It. And it's not just seniors, it's kind of across the spectrum. But I think we start taking a look a little bit about um, the range of abilities and looking at all ages and who are occupying these spaces. And that's why we wanna make sure that we're taking a look across that spectrum. Everyone deserves to have access and that need to be able to engage in what we provide for the public. Now, it's important to kind of talk about um, kind of language first, and this is not an absolute, but we do really like to focus on people first language. So it's it's more about the person and less about the ability or what they can or can't do. Um, and again, this is not kind of a hard and fast rule, but what we like to do is talk about the person with a disability or a special need versus some of the very old and outdated language that you know we don't typically use, disabled, invalid, cripple, lame, victim, none of those things are very positive. They're also very dated. But again, trying to use that person first language is really important in addressing that. Um, one thing I wanted to call out on this list in particular 
has to do with the accessible restroom and parking spaces. We, we see these all the time. It's actually kind of in the code. I mean, they're called handicapped parking spaces. That goes back to the old hand in cap, which has a little bit more of the, the hobo and or um, houseless person living on the street old connotation. Um, it's dated language. Um, but again, um, trying to be a little bit more thoughtful about using person first in general um, and really trying to um, be cognizant of the, the language that we're using in those considerations. So let's talk a little bit about um, accessibility in the ADA because that is kind of the starting point. Um, as folks know, ADA is the American with Disabilities Act. It is a civil rights law, which is important to note. Um, it is, which gives it a different criteria um, in looking at that. But in particular, we're looking at Title II, which has to do with public entities and how that gets carried over. Um, accessible design, which is designed um, by the ADA, is really a set of minimum regulations to provide access to and usability by people with disabilities. Um, you know, that's fairly standard. But I'm highlighting minimum regulations. It sets the low bar. And that's not what we should be designing towards. Um, it also is not as robust in looking at the range of abilities. Um, it's obviously focused um, a lot on mobility. There's very limited feedback on hearing. In fact, there's really only two things called out as far as flashing lights and uh, a few other warning pieces. But it certainly doesn't co cover the range of abilities um, out there. Um, and again, it's about looking at those minimums um, as a component. There are a variety of different standards and looking at that from you know, the 2010 um, efforts, they have a variety of new guidelines coming in place um, that have been coming in over the last you know, say 15 years. We get different outdoor developed areas that serve as baseline. Within California, we have the CBC chapter 11, B, which has a variety of different pieces that really kind of focus on some of the circulation, public buildings, and coordination. These are just some of the codes, not including ASTM and CPSC and a variety of other things that apply specifically to playgrounds. But these are all contexts about really trying to take a look at the minimums and basic pieces that are required. Which, you know, classic 19, mm, maybe 70s diagram. Um, but a lot of that focuses on, you know, some visual and auditory Im improvements, mainly focuses on mobility. It doesn't really talk much about cognitive and developmental, but the kind of the laundry list on the opposite side, you know, those are some of the kind of considerations that the ADA really kind of focuses on. It's about limitations of reach, of stamina, of looking at um, sight lines, detectable warnings, um, looking at a range of considerations on that front. However, as we kind of move forward, there are a range of things that aren't really addressed beyond that. And that's kind of where we get to the more inclusive considerations and kind of moving beyond some of those preliminary components and really looking at the autism spectrum, which is very diverse and certainly not a one size fits all. In fact, on the autism spectrum, some of the pieces that folks need to function are exactly the things that will cause someone else to not be able to focus. Um, and so that becomes a, an interesting consideration as we look across that band. The variety of sensory issues and whether people are hypo or hyper sensitive to stimuli and how they respond to that. There are a variety of intellectual disabilities, language barriers, cultural influences, you know, gender spectrum. But there's a range, range of things that we want to make sure that as we're looking at a place um, and designing to make spaces welcome to all, that we kind of look across that um, and make sure that we are not purposely excluding or setting up barriers that are, are going to be a consideration. Which gets moving to universal design, which has been talked about for, for a fair number of time, really trying to take a look at, you know, it is about looking at some of the minimum regulations to take a look at um, components, you know, that's kind of what accessible design is, is where are those minimums. Universal design tries to kind of push that a little bit more about trying to look at things that are usable by all people to the greatest extent possible without the need for adaptation. So it kind of goes to the lowest common denominator in order to try and take a look at how best to provide something that could be used by the most. It kind of gets us to a trying to get to a one size fits all um, opportunity. 
It's based around seven principles um, and Robin Moore, um, the M of MIG helped work on this while he was at North Carolina State. Um, but looking at equitable use, is it usable by as many people as possible? Is it flexible? Do I not, can I use it with, an, with a closed fist versus actually needing hand or twisting of knobs? Is it simple and intuitive? It, can we make it so that it's simple for folks to understand without having to kind of sort through? Um, how perceptible is the information? How tolerable is it of error? You know, do I have to get it exactly right? Do I have to push right on a certain spot for something to be activated? Is there a room for error? How much effort? Um, this also gets into some of the ADA considerations where about five pounds of pressure for activation points, but get into kind of what is that lowest level of component? And then looking at adequate space uh, for folks to be able to um, approach or engage in a component. And those are some of the basic principles within universal design. You know, again, we have at least eight senses. And so trying to take a look at that lowest common denominator when you're looking at that starts running into a little bit of trick um, in trying to take a look at where is the risk and how do we provide more information on, on that front so that there's still challenge. Um, if we go to the single lowest common denominator, we're missing out on some opportunities, um, but taking that and expanding on it is really where we're starting into inclusive design. So if accessible design is reducing barriers and kind of, you know, those minimum requirements and universal design is trying to take a look at kind of the, the lowest common denominator so you don't need adaptation and trying to get to a one size fits all consideration. Inclusive design is trying to take a look at this broad spectrum of diversity that we all bring and allowing multiple ways for people to engage in an activity or a setting. You know, it's the one size fits all, inclusive design is one size fits one. Now, are you always gonna be able to do that? No, but that's kind of a part of the context that we wanna try and set that in and trying to provide the greatest variety of ways for people to engage in whatever the activity is that we wanna try and take a look at. Um, Susan Goldsman, who I still can hear talking on my shoulder um, and yelling at me about, why are you not thinking about this? Um, but she has this, um, was interviewed a few years back um, and there was this great quote, which, which I'll read. Inclusive design doesn't mean you're designing one thing for all people. It means you're designing a diversity of ways for people to participate in an experience so that everyone has a sense of belonging. And I think it's that whole piece of trying to figure out um, not separate, but integrated in as many different ways. And we'll be talking a little bit more about that as we move forward, which gets us to kind of your, your classic inclusion 101. So we have exclusion, right? Certain people get to do things and other people are left out. Then we have segregation where you have a certain group that's grouped and other folks get to do it, but they get to do it in their own piece. So they're doing it separate from one another. We have integration, which is a little more of, you know, yep, we're all kind of doing it, but this group is doing it kind of separately in the middle of everything. Whereas inclusion is really trying to take a look at pulling everyone together and looking at it as a kind of a piece of whole, less separation, more integration and uh, inclusion and addressing how we want to kind of bring those all together um, and look at a little bit more holistically. This is a classic image, we've all seen it, um, but I think it's really helpful in trying to take a look at this whole equality equals sameness. There are three boxes, right? So on the left, you know, everyone gets the same thing. But if we aren't starting at the same place, we don't all get to the same endpoint. You know, equity is more about reallocating so that everyone has the same opportunity. It's a little more like equality, everyone gets a box, but in equity, everyone gets a view. And I think that's kind of a nice piece to try and take a look at how can we provide the most opportunities for everyone to get a view and be able to enjoy the activity. So this is a very old photo of, of me, I have to say. Um, 
probably 20 years now going back. Um, but one of the key things um, that we feel is really important and which you also hear from the um, disabled community itself is like, nothing for me without me. Um, don't design in a vacuum, really talk to the constituents, making sure that they are part of the process. Um, local experts are always key. And even though, you know, we've been doing this for 40 years, we've written books about it, there are always new things that, that need to be brought to the table, as well as local specifics that we really need to bring to it. Um, we know that um, there's a lot of Zoom meetings, including this, which we're doing right now, that brings, um, you know, that gets tiring for a lot of folks, the plus with some of the digital engagement, of course, that there's multiple ways for folks to, to participate and or across bigger timeframes and not at a specific time, particularly if things are recorded. Um, but trying to take a look at different ways we can look at bringing in feedback so that the community is part of the process um, and integrated throughout. Um, we're looking forward to being able to get on site, um, hopefully in a couple of weeks, to get some feedback from folks um, at Jolly Mind to get some feedback. But really, again, trying to get into how, what are the local needs? What's the local setting? How do we take a look at what's special and bringing that into the overall process um, so that it resonates and provides clear guidance. These are incredibly old um, images, but we've been doing it a long time. And the main thing we're trying to talk about is the materials change, things change over time, but really trying to get onto the site with the community and working with, with the folks that are currently using the site, as well as the folks who aren't using the site, but would like to and making sure that they're part of the process which gets us to inclusive play spaces and time check. Okay, we're close. Um, so, um, and looking at Jollyman specifically as we kind of take a look at this. So we've kind of set up why play is important. We've talked about some of the, the minor um, minimums that are identified, trying to take a look at a broader range of those considerations and expanding out the process. But in the end, we wanna have a quality play experience. And so there's a variety of different considerations here in taking a look at um, what we wanna be looking at. We want a variety of activities and looking at how diverse they can be. We wanna have as many open-ended components so it's not prescriptive. We want people to kind of make it what they want. Looking for sensory richness, looking for appropriate risk, which is critical so that you have a challenge. Looking at being flexible and adaptive. You know, there should be places for people to be comfortable, which is shade, taking a look at having enough temperature regulation. It should be welcoming, opportunities for gathering, it should be specific to the location, and it should be fun. I mean, we take fun very seriously, and that's a key part of it, but it is very specific. There are obviously a variety of conceptual play spaces. Um, you know, this is focusing on equipment, and that's often what happens with playground design specifically, is it's about a equipment and what people want to have, but what we should be focusing on is on the experience. What do we want to be doing and what's the best way to do that? It's really not about the equipment, it's about the experience. We've been designing play spaces, as I've mentioned a few times, for 40 years, um, and it's a range of uh, considerations within that, but trying to take a look at where's that richness, where's the things that are special to that location, where's the interaction, where's the context, and really taking a look at trying to provide a range of storytelling opportunities and flexibility for people to engage in activities in as many ways as possible. Um, and looking at ways so that it's not just one way to do it, but coming up with different ways. I mean, who thought that you could have so much fun playing with irrigation boxes? If you lay out irrigation boxes in the right way, you've got hopscotch or a mow band that makes maintenance easier between a lawn area and a planted area, it becomes the hidden path. But looking at those opportunities to bring in different textures, experiences, climbing components, provides a, a range of opportunities for folks to come together and have that integration and intergenerational consideration that is specific to a space. Um, we're trying to move away from the, the strip mall play where a playground you know, has no context to where it is. It's just like the rubber stamp cookie cutter, you know, pick out equipment from a catalog, put it in. Um, it needs to be really be developed and cited within the local context but taking a look at a much more robust range of what we are trying to provide as experiences for folks and the most interesting ways we can provide that. Um, Susan, as we talk about a lot because she guides a lot of the work that we do, even though she is no longer with us, um, she would talk about the ing, 
ing, ing. What ing is most important to this environment? You know, is it running, digging, swinging, climbing, or sleeping? Whatever it was, her next question was always, how many ways can we provide for people to engage in that activity? And not every place is gonna have every single bucket, but every community probably has some areas that they're most interested in. Is it swinging? Is it climbing? Is it traversing? Is it gathering? But whatever that those ings are, we want to provide as many different ways so that there's a variety of opportunities, so that there's challenge, but there, that's what's kind of starting to drive the opportunities that we look forward. So the classic swing, we've all seen it. There are never enough swings, we know. But if you take a look at the, these swings, obviously they're you know, the older classic, you know, belt swings. They don't accommodate if you're tall, if you're short, if you're big, if you're small, if you have multiple people, if you're older, you know, it's a pretty singular piece. However, if we take a look at how many different ways we can provide folks with a way to swing, if swinging is the ing or one of the ings, you know, do we take a look at group swings? Do we take a look at adaptive swings? Do we look at opportunities where you can look at one another, where it requires cooperative activity? There's a much broader range of what that can allow for folks to engage in that, that particular activity. Um, so with the thought of looking at as many different ways as we can provide opportunities for folks to engage in the component, there's some kind of key spaces and I'll go through these fairly, fairly quickly in the interest of time, but these are things that we look at um, as we approach play area guidelines, taking in consideration everything else we've talked about, but really trying to kind of do a little slightly deeper dive so that we're thinking about, as the image shows, some older with mobility limitations who are able to engage in the play with the, with the younger folks who are there. It's intergenerational, the rise opportunity and opportunities despite which side. Are you the caregiver? Are you the person who's actually playing? Are you both? And looking at ways that we can address those concerning. So within that, you know, there are basic kind of site design considerations we look at. We look at the perimeter, um, looking at screening. A lot of this is also dictated by the um, CPSC guidelines, et cetera. But making sure that we have some solitary retreats um, where folks who need a little less stimulation and have an opportunity to be seen but removed from the activity and still look out. Um, Fencing always comes into considerations, particularly if you have runners and the need to make sure that folks can more freely um, allow their children to play without being concerned that they're gonna run across the open field um, in a way, or if you have kids of multiple ages. And so looking at how we kind of group the five, to, the two to five versus the five to 12 play, and I would love to get out of using those ages as the limiters um, because I think we all should play. I'll play more than we are. Um, but try to take a look at, you know, what are those textures, components, what's happening as far as sight lines, sound, reverberation, trying to take be careful about echoes and being purposeful about where that happens if it is going to happen. Entrances, clear to have fewer of them, be clear about where they are for orientation looking at something that can be a visual cue so folks can better understand kind of how the site is laid out, um, looking at ways to bring in more unique coordination. That said, you don't want everything to be visible in a scan. You need to have uh, some way to orient the different activities while allowing folks to want to explore, but still have a sense of being able to understand kind of where the path is. That's where circulation starts becoming a key component in wayfinding. What are the cues? What's going to drive people along the path? Are there tactile components? Are there sensory components? Do we take a look at texture or color to kind of help provide some additional components where you deviate from a central path to a play area? Do we look at language? What's important within the overall context of, of your community's needs? Pathways are a huge part of the process and an untapped potential to actually make the path and circulation part of the play. It is more than a pathway. Um, it's a way to connect, get things oriented, but you can actually make activities within that, using that as a way to actually provide additional stimulation beyond the equipment and having that become uh, another aspect of that, that process. But to the point earlier about orientation, you need to have visual uh, 
variation and, and intrigue. If you can see everything at a glance, there's no surprise and there's no interest for wanting to come back. The power is in the details, but you still need to be thinking about how things are oriented and related so that folks can better understand and work through the space and see how things are connected so that they can get a sense of um, where they are in the overall layout um, within the space. Edges, again, we talked about fences, defining where things um, end, um, where there's enclosure, how much enclosure, um, and whether it's perceived or physical and or how physical it is, is a key thing to also consider. There are never enough opportunities for quality seating opportunities, um, not just for the caregivers, but also for folks that might have lower stamina and need to, to sit. Shade is a key part of that. Opportunities for there to be conversations and looking at how the seating is arranged and how that allows for someone to talk with someone else or to sign with someone else and having those sight lines be key. Taking a look at what other noise is happening so that you can take a look at not being surprised from the rear and having a conversation so you can anticipate when someone is coming is also a key part of that. You would think we talk a lot more about plants um, and it's a key piece um, and scent um, becomes a key consideration because as we've mentioned, that's a key memory cue for a lot of folks. Too much scent is also a problem for other folks. It's also a key thing on the allergy spectrum. But looking at what you can do with texture, scale, edibility, whether that's a maintenance concern, looking at shade, seasonal variation, how that brings um, a variety of opportunities to kind of create new opportunities to celebrate the seasons and come back time after time. Looking at textures, what's soft, what's tactile, what can be played with, what are loose parts. All of those things are considerations for us to be looking into. Looking again at movement. And movement sometimes isn't actually physically movement, it's feeling like you're moving. And so you see the, the little kind of um, uh, optical illusion where you spin the disc and you stare at it and you start feeling like you're spinning, but you aren't actually physically moving. It's totally a sensory component, but really trying to increase both the fine motor skills and large body um, motor skills, upper body, low body, taking a look at the range of considerations on that front. Swinging and spinning. Um, as we mentioned, there seems to be never enough swinging, but trying to, again, trying to take a look at where there are options to provide a range of considerations and trying to provide as many different ways to people to engage in that so that it allows for solo and or for social considerations, but also varying levels of support or needs for transfer, um, especially for those that have mobility limitations. Um, a huge range of you know, newer equipment that are coming up that really kind of allow for more interaction um, with a group and or group um, activation being part of the drive to bring that, as well as greater opportunities for, for looking at, at play that don't require transferring. I think, again, the biggest thing is equipment is, is a mechanism to allow for experiences to happen. We typically don't use that as the main driver. But I also think we want to take a look at where's the biggest um, return of opportunities um, and having the most rich experience so you can better leverage um, those pieces of equipment that are used so that they apply to a broader range is a key part of that. Climbing, upper body um, transfers, cables, um, log climbs. I mean, again, all of that is allows multiple senses um, to be put into play to provide a range of experiences, um, both as far as awareness and space, working on coordination, sequencing, um, collaboration, all of those pieces kind of fall into the overall component. Um, sensory, obviously, kind of there's a variety of pieces there, including planting and having kind of that things that move in the wind or have scent or have actual um, different textural um, components on, on the leaves. But musical instruments, we're certainly seeing a a broader increase there and much better tonal opportunities as far as the opportunity to kind of ex use that both individual play and group play. Again, you want to be careful about sound and where that's happening and what's happening with echo, um, how much sound so that there's not too much distraction. And again, taking a look at a range of considerations, um, but bringing more into that ring. Sand and water, I know it always comes up as an issue with, with cat concerns and coordination, um, it is the biggest bang for, for your buck as far as 
unstructured, textural, um, free open interpretation, collaborative and or individual. Um, sometimes there's water, sometimes there's not, but with water, it's certainly a, a huge plus, but it does have such a kind of key grain. It can keep people going for hours. Um, but we also know that there are some maintenance considerations, adjacency considerations, um, and just kind of ongoing um, discussions to take a look at that. But when you can do it, it has such a great return. Um, I don't know how many playgrounds I've seen where there are no trees or no plantings. Um, it's always just kind of sad. That's like the best part. I mean, that's where you want to see see the bugs, feel the grass, have that experience of kind of laying um, or working your hand through components, but that whole kind of sensory trigger and allowing your brain to kind of function and focus is really key. Something we're certainly seeing more of, including loose parts, um, which does have some maintenance considerations. But again, trying a range of, of opportunities for folks to engage at different scales is a key piece to that. Obviously, imagination um, and things that you can move or that you can kind of adjust around is really helpful. Um, again, trying to bring into the pieces of uh, addressing something that is site specific and working through um, specific to a site so it's not just universal um, and provides an opportunity to really kind of celebrate the community as an important piece, along with addressing um, you know, opportunities for donations or fundraising, celebrating the city, um, working through different components, um, and always having some gathering, seating, opportunities for a variety of activities to help support overall considerations. So that was a fast and kind of quick um, download of some of the different considerations through kind of code and understanding into some broader pieces for, for play and how we kind of approach inclusive play. Um, again, it's not one size fits all. It's trying to maximize the diversity of options that, that are provided and providing um, the most um, opportunities for the most individuals to really participate. You know, both as an individual and a bit social, but the power of play is not to be undervalued. Um, we should all take it seriously. Um, and with that, I'll say thank you very much.